first, texture, because that element is so fundamental to the very idea of orchestration. Since our common currency as orchestrators is the score, I've defined this as the vertical element. What is going on at the same time in terms of the cumulative effect of pitches and timbres? Another word for this is orchestral color. Simple, right? Wrong, because the act of combining tones carries the weight of all these other principles within it, each of which could fill another hour's lecture. But to deal with them quickly, the scope of the sound picture, is it intimate or towering? How does it inhabit the boundaries of a printed score? And remember, more is not necessarily bigger. Many instruments at once may create a very soft texture, whereas it only takes a few trombones to completely fill a hall. That leads us to the interrelated topics of collective timbre and harmonic resonance. The truth is that any single sound that we play, from any type of instrument, contains its own set of complex overtones and aspirants, by which we perceive its individual timbre. To make things even more interesting, these timbres may be varied by changes of technique or register. I'd speculate that we find these changes interesting because of our own evolved need to identify the voices of other people, whom we depend upon for survival. Our vocal cords are essentially musical instruments that create fundamental tones and use the inflection of overtones and changes of pitch to enhance meaning. And perhaps that's why orchestral music is so compelling in the end. It's more because of the contrasts between timbres than the unified homogeneous textures. Here's a spectrum analysis of four different instruments playing concert A in the bass staff, each a microcosm of orchestral texture. Note the superb clarity of the horn, and the extreme density of the bassoon. Here's something even more telling on the other side, the difference in overtones between a cello and a bass clarinet. As a string instrument, the cello favors one set of partials, very similar to those of the bassoon. But as a cylindrically bored woodwind instrument, the clarinet brings out a different set of overtones, as you can clearly see, both below and above the stronger upper partials of the cello. That's the mathematical principle of how individual timbre works. What's the practical application in an arrangement? How about this? If you want to fill in this section of overtones with both sets of partials, yet have a clearer sound, double your cellos with a bass clarinet. On the other hand, for a rich, complex, blended tone, double with the bassoons instead. And if you want to emphasize the fundamental in the first few partials, you can't beat a horn. It's as easy as that. Now imagine these diagrams don't represent single tones, but staves in an orchestral score. The bassoon looks like some sort of soupy, late romantic period opera score with triple winds, quadruple heavy brass, and octuple horns. The horn spectrum is more like a clean, disciplined, little collegium-sized work by Bach or Corelli. The cello and bass clarinet represent more of a classical spectrum of tones, clearer, well-defined, and yet full. This is more than just another thought experiment. The natural tendency of our ears is to favor the agreeable fulfillment of these overtones as a major chord. In fact, we name the intervals of the first few degrees of the harmonic series as consonances. Classical scores are full of direct realizations of these overtones, often as the final chord of a work. While you may consider this to be rather workaday, I recommend looking at some of these final tutti chords and listening to which instruments are used on what partial. Some of the approaches are quite intriguing to an orchestrator focused on color. To take the analogy further, in some sense, what we're doing when we create any texture is to realize or subvert the harmonic series. For example, there's the common wisdom of how and why to spread a chord across the orchestra. Densely packed lower tones rob a chord of its brilliance. Over-prominent middle register activity detracts from the resonance of higher tones and can weaken the bass. While there's no one perfect way to score a chord, there's no question that better examples bear a strong resemblance to the spacing of the harmonic series. And that's how we can sum up the quantum of harmonic resonance as a feature of vertical texture. 
The relationship of the lower, middle, and upper tones to one another controls the degree and character of textural resonance. That's such an important sentence, I'm going to repeat it again. The relationship of the lower, middle, and upper tones to one another controls the degree and character of textural resonance. If you take one thing away from this lecture, let it be that, and take it directly to a score by Debussy, Radovara, or Gustav Holst. The last two topics are also interrelated, as well as stepping stones to the next element of balance. Psychoacoustics is the study of how humans react emotionally and physiologically to sound. This is more than a footnote, by the way, even though I've placed it near the bottom of the list. In fact, it's essentially the preeminent quality of texture. What effect does it have on us? Does it stir us or leave us cold? Does it intrigue us or make us weep? Does it infuriate us, or trouble depths within us that we try not to acknowledge? Hopefully, something you compose will leave some kind of impression on the listener, other than the certainty that you could have orchestrated it better. But aside from these appeals to the emotions and intellect of the listener, there's also the essence of the structures of the sounds themselves. Subsonic tones can create a sense of anxiety, while supersonic tones can instill tension. When these tones are brought inwards to the range of hearing and orchestral playing, they retain at least a vestige of these physiological effects. The contrast between these outer sounds and the relative safety of the innermost middle four octaves can easily have an immediate influence on the listener. Just attend a drum and bass concert, which is a distillation of that effect, pounded into the listener for hours. <laughs> What's just as important, and quite often ignored, ahem, is the psychoacoustics of playing an orchestral instrument. This is because so very many composers for the past century and a half have been pianists, and more recently electronic keyboardists. On a piano, every tone takes exactly the same amount of minimal effort to play, and the tuning and intonation are carefully adjusted so that all tones have an integrated sound. What most pianists never realize is that this scheme is a fantasy a technological extension of an imaginary idea. It has very little relationship to the way music is produced by nature. Why? Because a piano is not a musical instrument. It's 88 separate musical instruments, each activated by its own key, none of which has the capacity to alter its pitch in the course of a normal performance, or at least, we hope not while we're playing. This gives pianists, and therefore most composers, an isolated view of what pitch is all about. It's a percussionist's view, or even smaller, it's the view of a percussionist who only plays one type of percussion instrument with one type of mallet. But for a string player, and even more for a wind or brass player, pitch is about tension and relaxation. The higher a pitch, the tenser the embouchure, or the smaller the resonant length of string. The waveform gets tighter and tighter, and the margin for error becomes smaller and smaller. At the other end, a low note can be difficult to initiate. A double bassist may have to flick an open string to get it to speak on the attack. The character of a staccato on the very lowest tones of a low brass or wind instrument becomes more about the breath and less about the pitch. The way in which these extremes are approached and departed from has a real physiological and psychological effect on a player, and if you're unmindful of this reality, then the emotion you can expect to engender in the orchestra will be mostly resentment, not wonder or exaltation. But all these factors bound together help the last item on the list to stay strong, programmatic imagery. If you're painting a picture with sound that has a visual context, then you want all the vertical elements to work together towards that goal. A lot of this depends on cultural cues. We expect a cymbal splash to evoke water, 
a piccolo to sound like a bird, and so on. Aside from these obvious cliches, and I'm as guilty of them as anybody, there's your own unique perspective to consider, and here's where I feel that texture can be at its most individual. For instance, in my case, I have a keen fascination with very subtle textures, and yet the bulk of my work for the past few years has been crossover orchestration and educational programming, both of which require a full-bodied approach. That's why I jumped at the chance to compose a harp concerto, because its very nature would require a light but complex hand. That's me, right there, in a depiction of the shifting cloudscape that's my constant visual companion, from the window of my little house high above Wellington Harbor. What a relief it was to compose and orchestrate something subtle and nebulous after so many hundreds of pages of tooties. But when all is said and done, texture is still a very simple thing to visualize and conceptualize. There it is, a simple vertical line displaying everything that's happening at once, more or less in order of pitch. Though we can deconstruct and contextualize and even atomize the essence of texture, the basic concept of it can't be reduced any further or eliminated. <laughs> 